Part five of an excursion to the lakes in Westmoreland and Cumberland, August seventeen seventy three, by William Hutchinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around Keswick. We visited a druidical monument within about two miles of Keswick, situate to the south of the road which we had passed from Penrith. This monument is placed on a plain formed on the summit of a hill, around which the adjoining mountains make a solemn circle. It is composed of stones of various forms, natural and unhewn. They seem to have been collected from the surface, but from what lands it is impossible to conjecture, most of them being a species of granite. These stones are fifty in number, and are set in a form not exactly circular, the diameter being thirty paces from east to west, and thirty-two from north to south. At the eastern end, a small enclosure is formed within the circle by ten stones making an oblong square. In conjunction with the stones of that side of the circle, seven paces in length and three in width within. In this place, we conjectured, the altar had been erected. At the opposite side, a single square stone is laid at the distance of three paces from the circle. Possibly this may have been broken off, and is only the foot of such a column as Long Meg in the Salkeld Monument, which may have been used to bind the victims to. The stones forming the outward line are some of them standing erect, others fallen, and the same observation is to be made as to the appearance of entrances as at Salkeld. The stones here are of various sizes, some of the largest of those which are standing being near eight feet in height and fifteen feet in circumference. A clergyman whose property the pasture ground is, in which this monument stands, and with whom we gained an acquaintance during our stay at Keswick, told us he was determined to destroy the place as it prejudiced his ground, so that perhaps by these sacrilegious hands the curious will shortly be deprived of this valuable piece of antiquity. A late discovery has been made of large quantities of black lead, a mineral peculiar to this country, and nowhere else to be found in Europe, amongst the gravel and earth on the shore of Vickers Island. Whether it has lodged there by the floods, or how otherwise has been collected, is not known. But so valuable the discovery was thought, that it occasioned an inquiry by what means the whole lake might be drained, conceiving that from this specimen immense wealth would be obtained by such an undertaking. The fish of this lake are trouts, pike, eels and perch. The romantic scenes upon the lake induced us to take a boat at night, under the favour of the moon, which was near the full. We began our voyage from after the moon was risen, and she had illumined the top of Skiddow, but from the intercepting mountains had not within the ascent of an hour reached the lake. We were surrounded with a solemn gloom. The stillness of the evening rendered the voice of the waterfalls tremendous, as they, in all their variety of sounds, were re-echoed from every cavern. The summits of the rocks began to receive the rising rays, and seemed to be crowned with turrets of silver, from which the stars departed for their nightly round. As the light advanced, objects arose to view, as if surging in the first morning from chaos. The water was a plain of sable, sprinkled over with gems reflected from the starry firmament. The groves which hung upon the feet of the mountains were hid in darkness, and all was one grave and majestic circle of shadow, till the moon, rising in cloudy majesty, at length apparent queen, unveiled her peerless light, and o'er the dark her silver mantle threw, Milton's paradise lost. When the long protracted shadows of the mountains, cast on the bosom of the lake, showed the vastness of those masses from whence they proceeded, and still, as the moon arose higher in the horizon, the distant objects began to be illumined, and the whole presented us with a noble moonlight peace, delicately touched by the hand of nature, and far surpassing those humble scenes which we had often viewed in the works of the Flemish painters. Mists began to arise on the lake, and by reason of the air which bore them aloft, being confined and eddying within this deep circle, they were whirled round and carried upwards like a column, 
which so soon as it approached the rays of the moon had a most wonderful appearance and resembled a pillar of light i recollect that maupetui describing the lake and mountain of niemi in lapland speaks of a phenomenon of the like nature which the people called haltius and which they esteemed to be the guardian spirits of the place be these as they might we may venture to assert no druid no saint herbert no genius had a more glorious ascension the moon's mild beams now glistened on the waters and touched the groves the cliffs and islands with a meekness of colouring which added to the solemnity of the night and these noble and romantic objects struck us with reverence and inspired the mind with pious sentiments and ejaculations it was observable that by day we were incessantly communicating our raptures and surprise on each new wonder that opened to our view we now enjoyed them in silence every bay and each promontory assumed an appearance very different from what it had by daylight the little dells which wind around the feet of the mountains as they were shadowed by interposing objects or silvered by the moon afforded most enchanting scenes where we might have wandered with delight through the whole night where the lake narrows and runs up in a creek towards borrowdale the rocks looked horrible almost shutting us in from the face of heaven which could be beheld only by looking immediately upright the cliffs were struck with scanty gleams of light which gained their passage through the interstices of the hills or chasms in the rocks and served only to discover their tremendous overhanging fronts their mighty caverns where the water struck by our oars made a hollow sound their deformed and frowning brows their hanging shrubs with which they were bearded their sparkling waterfalls that trilled from shelf to shelf the whole half seen and half concealed leaving imagination at large to magnify the images of their grandeur and horrible magnificence the pursuit which engaged us the next morning was to gain the summit of skiddar which by the winding pass we were obliged to make afforded a laborious ascent of five miles the prospect which we gained from this eminence very well rewarded our fatigue to the southeast we had a view over the tops of mountains one succeeding to or overlooking the other a scene of chaos and mighty confusion this was the prospect which dr brown described by the image of a tempestuous sea of mountains below us laid the lake with all the beauties of its margin together with the vale of keswick and the waters of basnet as if delineated on a chart to the south the hills towards cockermouth though less rugged and romantic than those towards the southeast were yet no less stupendous to the northwest we had the prospect of a wide and barren heath extending its plains to carlisle and terminated by the mountains of scotland to the northeast we regained the prospect of that spacious circus in which penrith stands the queen of the vale overtopped by cross fell which forms the most distant background the air was remarkably sharp and thin compared with that from which we passed in the valley and respiration seemed to be performed with a kind of asthmatic oppression while we remained upon the mountain over the hills which lay between keswick and cockermouth dense and dark vapours began to arise and in a little time as they advanced upon a south-west wind concealed from us those heights which we had viewed half an hour before clear and distinct our guide was very earnest with us to quit the mountain as he prognosticated a storm was collecting and we should be in danger of being wet or in hazard of losing our way in the heavy vapour which he assured us would soon cover skiddo the circumstance was too singular to be left by people curious in their observations on natural events we desired our guide would take care of himself and leave us to our pleasure but the good attendant had a due sense of our impropriety in wishing to be left there and determined to abide by us the clouds advanced towards us with accelerated speed a hollow blast sounded amongst the hills and dells which lay below us and seemed to fly from the approaching darkness the vapour rolled down the opposite valley of newland 
and appeared to tumble in mighty sheets and volumes from the brow of each mountain into the vale of keswick and over the lakes whilst we stood to admire this phenomenon the mighty volumes of clouds which we beheld below us gradually ascended and we soon found the summit of skiddow totally surrounded whilst we on every side looked down upon an angry and impetuous sea heaving its billows as if boiling from the bottom we were rejoicing in this grand spectacle of nature and thinking ourselves fortunate in having beheld so extraordinary an event when to our astonishment and confusion a violent burst of thunder engendered in the vapour below us stunned our sense being repeated from every rock and down every dell in the most horrid uproar at the same time from the agitation of the air the mountain seemed to tremble at the time of the explosion the clouds were instantaneously illuminated and from innumerable chasms sent forth streams of lightning our guide laid upon the earth terrified and amazed in his ejaculations accusing us of presumption and impiety danger made us solemn indeed we had nowhere to fly for safety no place to cover our heads to descend was to rush into the very inflammable vapour from whence our perils proceeded to stay was equally hazardous for now the clouds which had received such a concussion by the thunder ascended higher and higher enveloping the whole mountain and letting fall a heavy shower of rain we thought ourselves happy even under this circumstance to perceive the storm turning northwestward and to hear the next thunderclap burst in the plain beyond Basnet's water a like event has frequently happened to travellers in the heights of the alps from whence the thunderstorms are seen passing over the countries beneath them the echoes from the mountains which bordered keswick lake from newland from borrowdale from lodore were noble and gave a repetition of the thunderclaps distinctly though distant after an intermission of several seconds tremendous silence the rain which still increased formed innumerable streams and cascades which rushed from the crown of skiddow saddleback and causey pike with a mighty noise but we were deprived of the beauty of these waterfalls by their intercepting vapour which was not to be penetrated by the eye more than a few yards before us we descended the hill wet and fatigued and were happy when we regained our inn at keswick which we now esteemed a paradise although we had despised it before for its dirtiness and inconvenience we took leave of our slovenly and besotted host and pursued our route from keswick to ambleside a stage of eighteen miles for romantic mountainous and wild scenes this stage affords the finest ride in the north of england the whole road lying in a narrow and winding dell confined by a stupendous range of mountains on either hand in some places the vale is not wider than merely to admit the road in other places it opens in little valleys and again is shut in various forms we passed near the rocks of st john's which on nearer view lost most of their grotesque appearance and as we winded by the feet of these lofty hills creeks filled with wood afforded us many pretty though narrow landscapes through which little rills arising on the sides of the mountains poured down their hasty and gurgling waters the rain which had fallen the day before improved the beauties of the place the cascades were innumerable and their figures various at one point of view we took in nine cascades falling from eminences seven or eight hundred feet perpendicular height where some of them fell from the very brows of the hills they appeared as strings of silver but descending further spread into sheets of foam and before they reached the middle of the hills tumbled headlong from precipice to precipice with a confused noise every turn of the road and every valley gave us a new scene the prospects were ever changing and diversified at length we reached a narrow lake called Lazewater, where the vale widened scattered trees and some little enclosures adorned its margin and here and there a cottage we rode by the side of this lake for the distance of two miles so far it stretched along the vale on every hand enjoying little rural scenes which renewing to us a succession of pastoral images which we had collected from the poets in our early years when the young mind was charmed with romance 
and the most fantastic ideas of rural innocence retirement and love neither did these images pass in the imagination only for in this sequestered vale we met with a female native full of youth innocence and beauty simplicity adorned her looks with modesty and hid her downcast eye virgin apprehension covered her with blushes when she found herself stayed by two strangers and as she turned her eyes for an instant upon us they smote us with all the energy of unaffected innocence touched with doubtfulness her lips which in the sweetest terms expressed her apprehension showed us teeth of ivory and on her full forehead ringlets of auburn flowed carelessly a delicacy of proportion was seen over her whole figure which was easy and elegant as nature's self my companion in a rapture snatched out his pencil and began to imitate but the unaffected impatiency and sweet confusion of the maid overcame our wishes to detain her and we let her pass reluctantly after this little adventure we jogged on silent and wrapped up each in his own cogitations till we began to descend the hill towards the valley of grasmere we were roused by the unexpected beauties of the scene and as if moved by one thought we stopped gazed at each and smiled before we could condescend to snatch ourselves from the ideal pleasures we had been enjoying we were each conscious of our situation and at length laughed aloud no otherwise communicating our sentiments but by our looks which sufficiently explained our sympathetic and silent delight end of part five recorded at castle rig circle at derwentwater by keswick on the slopes of skiddaw and at thirlmere part six of an excursion to the lakes in westmoreland and cumberland august seventeen seventy three by william hutchinson this librivox recording is in the public domain grasmere and home via kendall we were charmed with the view of grasmere a retirement surrounded by hills on every hand the vale is about four miles in circumference of meadow and pasture ground near the middle of this valley is a fine lake beautified with an island from a mount a little distance from the church we viewed the whole circle delighted with the situation the fields were full of freshness and verdure the scene was ornamented with a few humble cottages dispersed on the borders of the lake amongst which the sacred fane stood solemnly superior the hills were here and there graced with a few trees and animated by white flocks of sheep it seemed to be the perfect vale of peace we had not passed far from this sweet sequestered scene before we entered rydale where we were again charmed with new retreats and happy retirements here we found a cultivated vale not equal in width to grasmere but full of pretty enclosures and watered with a lake on which a fine woody island arises we passed along the windings of this dale till we reached the seat of sir michael fleming an ancient mansion standing on the opening of the dale on the southern decline of the hills which abound in woodland and front to the lake of windermere the ground before this seat is prettily diversified with irregular knots of trees situate on natural eminences and scattered with such agreeable wildness and irregularity that they seem to be the work of nature the interspaces between these knots of trees were mown in narrow meandering walks at the distance of half a mile opposite to the house are lofty rocks and hanging woods of oak which form the channel of the river that feeds the lake ambleside is situate on the swift decline of a hill over which many high mountains arise towards the north the first appearance of our inn induced us to apprehend we should hasten our departure but the assiduous desire of pleasing shown in the conduct of the people counterbalanced their deficiencies here we met with a gentleman mr penny of pennybridge who was conversant with every curiosity in the country his polite and genteel behaviour rendered our stay at ambleside very agreeable by this gentleman's directions his servants conducted us about a mile up the woody declivity of the hill behind the inn where we saw a most amazing cascade totally different from anything we had met with upon our tour 
making so great an ascent and not having reached a third of the height of this eminence it might be supposed that when we gained the view it would be something extraordinary the rushing of the waters in the fall sounded through the wood as we approached it and seemed at once as if it was bursting over our heads and tumbling beneath our feet this was soon reconciled for in a few steps we perceived ourselves to be upon the summit of a cliff which overhung the channel of the stream where an old oak suspended his romantic boughs over the precipice this was the only opening of the wood or situation where we could look into this tremendous gulf the river which falls here arises on the very height of the mountains and flows in a very confined channel through an opening of rocks the edges of which were grown with stately trees and thronged with thickets of hazel birch and holly we could look upwards from the place where we stood for about one hundred perpendicular yards where we saw the river in two streams pouring through the trees about the midway it united and was again broken by a craggy rock grown with fern and brushwood which threw it into two branches foaming and making a horrid noise but it soon united again and from thence precipitated into a deep and dreary gulf for above sixty yards below the cliff on which we stood from whence it tumbled from rock to rock and dashed through a rough and craggy channel down to the town of ambleside with a mighty sound which shook the air so as to give a sensible agitation to the nerves like the effect of a thunderclap the whiteness of the fretting waters was beautifully contrasted by the black rocks which formed their passage it was almost impossible for the steadiest eye to look upon this waterfall without giddiness its beauties for a painter were noble and various the wood which hung upon the rocks over the stream was of mixed hues the trees projecting from each precipice knotty and grotesque the cliffs were black and fringed with ivy and fern which give a singular luster to the waterfall no fancy could exceed the happy assemblage of objects which rendered this view picturesque the traces of ambleside's antiquity are not now to be found the inhabitants have not preserved any of the roman monuments which were formerly discovered here from ambleside we went to bowness a small village on the shore of the lake of windermere this was a delightful ride lying within a little distance of the water which was open to our view as we passed through various turnings of the road the sides of the way are ornamented with woods meadows and pasture ground the owner of the white lion inn at bowness has a boat on the lake with which we were accommodated this lake is very different from those we had seen in cumberland being in length about twelve computed miles and not a mile in width in the broadest part the hills seen around the lake except those above ambleside are humble the margin of the water is irregular and indented and everywhere composed of cultivated lands woods and pastures which descend with an easy fall into the lake forming a multitude of bays and promontories and giving it the appearance of a large river in the narrowest parts not unlike to the thames below richmond on that part where furness fell forms the shore the scene is more rude and romantic the western side of this lake is in lancashire the eastern in westmoreland as we sailed down the lake from bowness we had two views which comprehended all its beauties we rested upon the oars in a situation where looking down the lake we took into the prospect the greatest extent of water the shore was indented by woody promontories which shot into the lake on each side to a considerable distance to the right were the hills of furness fell which are the highest that arise immediately from the water consisting chiefly of rocks which though not rugged and deformed have their peculiar beauty being scattered over with trees and shrubs each of which grows separate and distant the brow of this rock overlooks a pretty peninsula on which the ferry boat house stands concealing its white front in a grove of sycamores whilst we were looking on it the boat was upon its way with several horse passengers which greatly graced the scene to the left a small island of a circular form laid covered with a thicket of ash and birch wood beyond which the hills that arose from the lake in gentle ascents to the right were covered with rich herbage and irregular groves on the left side of the lake enclosures of meadow 
sweeping gently away from the water lay bounded by a vast tract of woods and overtopped with hills of moorish ground and heath the most distant heights which formed the background were fringed with groves over which they lifted their brown eminences in various shapes upwards on the lake we looked on a large island of about thirty acres of meagre pasture ground in an irregular oblong figure here and there some misshapen oak trees bend their crooked branches on the sandy brinks and one little grove of sycamores shelters a cottage the few natural beauties of this island are wounded and distorted by some ugly rows of firs set in right lines and by the works now carrying on by mr english the proprietor who is laying out gardens on a square plan building fruit walls and preparing to erect a mansion house there the want of taste is a misfortune too often attending the opulent the romantic sight of this place on so noble a lake and surrounded with such scenes asked for the finest imagination to have designed the plan of an edifice and pleasure grounds but instead of that to see a dutch burgomaster's palace arise on this place to see a cabbage garth extend its bosom to the east squared and cut out at right angles is so offensive to the eye of the traveller that he turns away with disgust for pleasure or for ornament a narrow footpath is cut round the margin of the island and laid with white sand resembling the dusty paths of foot passengers over stepney fields or the way along which the owner often has hayed to hackney i would overlook this misshapen object while i viewed the lake upwards with its environs the beautiful crags of furnace fell over which trees are dispersed in an agreeable wildness form the front ground on the left and by their projection cover the hills which are further advanced towards the head of the lake which makes a curve bearing from the eye three small woody islands of a fine circular figure and swelling to a crown in their centres arise from out of the lake with the deep verdure of their trees giving an agreeable tint to the azure hue the water received from reflection of the serene sky above over an expanse of water of the length of six miles and near a mile in breadth shining and bright as a mirror we viewed the agreeable variety of the adjacent country to the right woodlands and meadows in many little peninsulas and promontories descended with easy slopes to the brink of the lake where we viewed bonus church and its cottages arising above the trees beyond which lay the seat of fletcher fleming esq situate on the brink of the lake and covered on every side with rich woodland further were cots and villages dispersed upon the rising ground in the front stood ambleside and at the opening of the deep vale of rydale the house of sir michael fleming shielded on either hand by a wing of hanging forests climbing up the steps of the mountains the nearest background to the right is composed of an eminence called orest head rising gradually to a point and cultivated to its crown which sweet mount is contrasted by the vicinage of the crags of biscotho which overtop the extensive woodlands of mr fleming then troutbeck parks arise where the hills begin to increase in magnitude and form the range of mountains which are extended to keswick diversified with pasturage dells and cliffs looking over which langdon pikes three mountains rising in perfect cones extend their heads surmounted only by the rocky and barren brow of kirkston fell whose cliffs overlook the whole the lake of windermere differs very much from those of holswater and keswick here almost every object in view on the whole lake confesses cultivation the islands are numerous but small and woody and rather bear a resemblance to the artificial circles raised on gentlemen's ponds for their swans the great island is little better than a bank of sand but is now under the spoiling hand of a deformer the innumerable promontories are composed of fine meadow ground and ranges of trees the hills except furnace fell and those above ambleside are tame and on every hand a vast expanse of woodland is stretched upon the view the painters of poussin describe the nobleness of holswater the works of salvator rosa express the romantic and rocky scenes of keswick and the tender and elegant touches of claude lorraine and smith pencil forth the rich variety of windermere the greatest depth of windermere we were told was not more than forty fathom 
The water abounds in pike, trout, char, eels and perch. The lake, whilst we visited it, was covered with the boats of fishing parties. It's been customary for the country people, after their hay harvest, to make their days of jubilee in that diversion. In the church of Bowness is a window of painted glass, which was preserved at the dissolution of Furness Abbey and brought hither. The present remains show that it has contained very fine colouring in its former state. The arms of France and England, quartered, are well preserved at the top of the window. The design is a crucifixion, in figures as large as life. By the hands, feet and parts remaining, it seems to have been of singular beauty. On the dexter side of the crucifixion is St George slaying the dragon, on the sinister the Virgin Mary, an uncouth assemblage. Beneath are the figures of a knight and his lady kneeling, before whom are a group of kneeling monks, over whose head are wrote W. Hartley, Thomas Honson and other names, by the breaking of the glass rendered not legible. Furness Abbey was dedicated to St Mary, to whom also Bowness is inscribed. We went from Windermere to Kendal. The road lies chiefly over barren and rocky hills, without change or variety to afford any pleasure to the traveller. Towards the right, in the course of the way, appeared two openings, which showed to us a small bay of the sea, but these without any degree of beauty. We descended to the town of Kendal, rejoiced to change the prospects from barrenness and waste to a rich cultivated vale and a town thronged with industrious inhabitants, busied in a prosperous manufactory. Kendal stands on the side of a hill facing to the east. As we looked over the buildings from the heights which we were descending, we had a view of the ruins of Kendal Castle, seated on the crown of a fine eminence at the distance of half a mile from the town, and separated from it by the river Can, over which two stone bridges are thrown. The castle is now totally in decay, and scarce gives any idea by its present appearance of its ancient strength and grandeur. On the front opposite to the town, the remains of bastions are seen, at the south-east and north-west corners, whilst all behind consists of confused and ragged walls. The whole has formed a square defended by a ditch. Above the town of Kendal, immediately opposite to the castle, is a mole of a very singular form, called by the inhabitants Castle Law Hill. Above the town, some rocks show themselves of the height of seven fathom, or near it, on which a mount has been thrown up of gravel and earth, of an exact circular form, arising from the plain on top of the rock near thirty feet. At the front adjoining the town is a spacious level, on part of which a bowling green is now made. The mole is defended by a deep ditch which extends itself from the brink of the rocks, and on the right and left the plain is fortified by an inferior mole or mount. The crown of the great mole is flat, and has been defended by a breastwork of earth and a narrow ditch, and from east to west a ditch is struck through the centre. The whole circumference of the crown is 61 paces. The account given by the inhabitants of this place is that it was cast up for battering the castle, but for this purpose there was no need of so laborious a work, it being also much above the level of the castle, opposite to which many natural eminences might serve for that end. We passed from Kendal to Barrowbridge, a single house, situate in a very narrow deep valley, hemmed in on every side by mountains covered with verdure. A fine stream serpentines through the vale, and here and there little cottages are dispersed with scanty enclosures of meadow ground, over which hangs a narrow wood, from the rising of the hills. Shut in on every side, this is a place calculated for the most solemn retirement. In winter, the rays of the sun for several weeks do not touch the vale, but only gild the mountains, along whose sides the opposite land sends an extensive shadow, whose gradations are daily marked by the watchful eye of the peasant, longing for returning vegetation. Here might the recluse enjoy the pleasures of solitude and sacrifice to virtue. Here might he avoid the sins of the world and commune with his own soul, and whilst commenting on the wondrous scene before him, look through nature up to nature's God, Pope. We walked along the banks of the brook that murmured through the pebbles. We strayed over the little meads, we sauntered in every grove, charmed with the deepness of the retirement. 
the pleasures of the scene were enhanced to me by my recollection of past felicity which i had enjoyed from an evening ramble in these sequestered walks ideas flowed upon my mind replete with delicate sentiments whilst images of a happy complexion possessed reflection and presented to me my family and my beloved infants joy and affection melted my whole soul and involuntary tears took the silent expression of my tenderness and transport lost in selfishness i have trespassed upon my reader and covered a page with impropriety i hope the digression may be pardoned from hence we continued our route to kirby stephen near which place we visited the ruins of pendragon castle of which the remains of a square tower only are left and that most probably of a modern date for this place was repaired after it had laid in ruins for near two centuries by the countess of pembroke about the time she had restored bruff the situation of this place being in a deep dell on every hand overlooked by mountains from whence it might be annoyed shows it never could be built as a place of strength but rather as a retreat and place of concealment in times of danger opposite to this place on the other side of the dell is a small entrenchment fortified by a ditch and vallum but of what date or people no accounts can be obtained the prince Uta pendragon is of doubtful existence but is said to have died by treachery and poison put in a well in the year five hundred and fifteen we passed by the ancient seat of the wharton family in wharton parks now in decay melancholy reflections arise on such a view when the traveller must necessarily exclaim with a sigh such are the effects of dissipation and vice end of part six recorded by grasmere lake end of an excursion to the lakes in westmoreland and cumberland august seventeen seventy three by william hutchinson Recorded by Phil Benson.